Federal Income Tax Accounting, 1968 Federal Tax Course by Commerce Clearinghouse, Chapter 2, Individuals' Taxes, Returns, Individual Return, a Framework of the Tax Law. Having made a cursory examination of all federal taxes in Chapter 1, we begin our inquiry into the nature and effect of income tax with an inspection of tax returns which individuals must file. Within the headings and schedules of individual return forms discussed in the following pages are leads to problems of tax accounting, inclusions, exclusions, and deductions, which are the subject headings of the following chapters. Who must file a return? Each individual must file a return of his gross income for the taxable year is $600 or more. This is the general rule, but there are exceptions. If the taxpayer has reached the age of 65 before the close of the taxable year, he need not file an income tax return unless his gross income is $1,200 or more. A self-employed taxpayer, regardless of his age, must ordinarily file at least a partial return, including Schedule C, if his net earnings from self-employment are $400 or more. These rules apply to citizens, whether they reside at home or abroad, and to resident aliens. The rules for non-resident aliens are in Chapter 24. The $600 or more requirement <clears throat> applies to gross income and not to adjusted gross income or to taxable income. A return may be required even though no tax is due because the taxpayer's deductions and exemptions exceed his gross income. Actually, it is to this taxpayer's advantage to file a return to secure a refund of any taxes withheld from wages by an employer. His return on Form 1040 or Form 1040A will serve as his claim for refund. The fact that income may be excluded because it is earned abroad, paragraph 2405, does not avoid its treatment as gross income for this $600 test. Example, a student worked two and one half months during the summer for $250 a month, paid semi-monthly. He returned to college in the fall and had no other income for the year. Although the tax table, paragraph 3023, shows no tax on $625 of adjusted gross income, the student is required to file a return. Moreover, it is to his advantage to file it in order to recover the $70, $14 each payday, that was withheld by his employer from his $625 in wages. Earnings of a minor are taxable to the minor, and he must file his own return. The parent should not report the child's earnings on his, the parent's return. If a guardian has been appointed, the return should be filed by the guardian. Right to file separate or joint returns. An election is available to all married taxpayers, permits the filing of either joint or separate returns. The effect of a joint return is that the combined income of husband and wife is attributed one half to each spouse. Even though the husband earns all the income, it is treated as though it had been earned 50% by the husband and 50% by the wife. The tax on a joint return is, in effect, computed on one half of the joint income and then multiplied by two. This, this, tax, this saving in tax is affected through the use of a rate table for husband and wife. Example, after taking the appropriate deductions, including the personal exemption deductions, James Abel's taxable income is $16,000. All this income was earned by James. His wife contributed nothing. They file a joint return. Taxable income, $16,000. Tax on $16,000, using the table at paragraph 3016, $3,260. Using intermediate operation, tax rates are applied to one half of $16,000, or $8,000. Tax on $8,000, using the table at paragraph 3015, is $1,630. Multiplied by 2 for the final tax, 2 times 
3260 the same tax as using the rate tables at paragraph 3016. If the tax had been computed on the basis of $16,000 of taxable income without splitting, the tax would have come to $4,330. By filing a joint return, taxpayer has saved $1,070 in taxes. A joint return can be filed unless one spouse is a non-resident alien. However, it should be noted that a husband and wife are jointly and severally liable for the tax on a joint return, which means that the entire tax liability may be assessed against either spouse. A joint return may be filed even though one of the spouses has no income, credits, or deductions. On a joint return, both spouses have the same taxable year, must have the same taxable year. If before their marriage, the wife has been on a calendar year basis and the husband on a fiscal year basis, and they wish to file a joint return, one or the other will have to obtain consent to make a change in his accounting period so that both taxable years start on the same date. Married taxpayers are not required to file joint returns, but only married taxpayers may file a joint return. Marital status is determined as of the last day of the taxable year, except in the case of death. If a taxpayer is married as of midnight on the last day of the taxable year, he may file a joint return for that year. An individual who is separated from his spouse under a legal decree of divorce or separate maintenance is not married and may not file a joint return. A taxpayer is still married if he is separated under an interlocutory decree of divorce, that is, a decree that requires a waiting period before it becomes final. Joint returns for widows or widowers. A joint return may be filed for a decedent and his or her surviving spouse for the year in which death occurred. In this case, if death occurs before the close of the taxable year of the surviving spouse, marital status is determined as of the date of death, but the joint return is filed for the full year as if the death had not occurred. There is another joint return benefit for a surviving spouse. The surviving spouse may file a return for each of the two years following the year in which death of the other spouse occurred and on this return the joint return rates are applied. This is permissible only if the surviving spouse remains unmarried and maintains as his home a household which is the principal place of abode of one of the following and only if the taxpayer is entitled to a dependency exemption for such person, a son, a stepson, a daughter, a stepdaughter. A taxpayer may be a surviving spouse for this purpose only if he could have filed a joint return for the year of death, whether or not he did in fact file a joint return. Example, A's wife died on September 10, 1966. After his wife's death, A continued to live in their home. Their two children, ages 12 and 14, continued to live with A and depended upon him for their care and support. These circumstances existed throughout 1967. A had not remarried before the end of 1967. A is a surviving spouse, and he is entitled to file a return on which he can apply the beneficial joint return rates. If the same situation exists during the taxable year 1968, the same rule applies. For 1969 and thereafter, a would probably qualify for the head of a household benefits, even though the children are no longer dependents, provided, of course, that they continue to live with him. See paragraph 214. The spatial rates for the head of a household are lower than for an otherwise single person. Taxpayer's election. A surviving spouse may file a joint return if the taxable years of both spouses begin on the same day and end on different days only because of the death of either or both. But if the surviving spouse remarries before the close of his taxable year, he may not elect to make a joint return with the first spouse who died during the taxable year. 
A surviving spouse may, on the other hand, make a joint return with a new spouse, provided the other requirements for making a joint return are met. A second exception is that a surviving spouse may not make a joint return with the deceased spouse if the taxable year of either is a fractional year because of a change in accounting period. Types of Income Tax Return Forms There are two different return forms which, which may be filed by individuals, Form 1040 and Form 1040A. Form 10, 1040 is the basic return form. It consists of two pages with spaces for the reporting of net income items, dividends and interest, tax computation, credits against tax, personal and dependency exemptions, and itemized deductions. Except as noted in the following paragraph, income other than salaries, wages, dividends, and interest is to be reported on separate schedules to be attached to Form 1040. These schedules are as follows. Schedule B for pensions, annuities, rents, royalties, and other income or losses not required to be reported elsewhere. Schedule C for profit or loss from business or profession. Schedule D for gains and losses from sale or exchange of capital and non-capital assets. Schedule F for farm income and expenses and Schedule G for income averaging. Form 1040 must be used by an individual whose adjusted gross income is $10,000 or more and may be used if his adjusted gross income is less than $10,000. Form 1040A is a simplified punch card form which can be used if gross income is under $10,000 and a number of special requirements are satisfied. See paragraph 203. <clears throat> Income Tax Form 1040 Simplified. The individual taxpayer makes out his return on Form 1040. It is not a difficult form if its fundamental structure is understood. The chart below gives you an idea of how it is set up. The actual presentation of material and sequence on the form, however, differ from the arrangement shown on the chart. For example, gross business profits, a gross income item, and business expenses, deductions from gross income, are shown on separate Schedule C of Form 1040, and only net profit or loss is entered on Form 1040. On the chart, we have gross income minus deductions from gross income equals adjusted gross income minus non-business expenses or the standard deduction and minus exemptions equals taxable income. Time of filing. Individuals' returns must be filed by the 15th day of the fourth calendar month following the close of the taxable year, April 15th for a calendar year. When April 15th falls on a Saturday, a Sunday, or a legal holiday, national or statewide in the state where the return is required to be filed, the return may be filed by the next succeeding business day. Extensions of time. An extension of time for filing may be had on good cause shown. Except for taxpayers who are abroad, the extension may not exceed six months. Place of filing. An individual's return is filed with the district director of the district in which his legal residence or principal place of business is located or at the regional service center serving such district. If he has no legal residence or place of business, it is filed with the Director of International Operations, Internal Revenue Service, Washington, D.C., 20225. Amended Returns. Any taxpayer may revise a return previously filed by filing an amended return within the time allowed for filing the original return. After the date on which a return is due, however, an amended return has no legal effect as a return. Taxpayer's election. If adjusted gross income is $5,000 to $10,000, a taxpayer filing Form 1040A will use the standard deduction, paragraph 921. Compute his own tax from the rate tables and pay with the card when filed. 
If income is less than $5,000, then Form 1040A can be used in conjunction with the optional tax table, and the tax can be shown and paid, or the taxpayer can let the district director compute the tax. Choosing between joint or separate returns. When will a joint return result in a lower tax? On a joint return, 50% of the combined income is attributed to the husband and 50% to the wife. This is also true of their deductions. Because of the graduations and the income tax rates, the filing of a joint return almost always results in a lower tax, especially where one spouse has little or no income. There are two instances in which the filing of a joint return might result in a higher tax. One of these is where both spouses have combined capital losses which exceed their capital gains by more than $1,000. On a joint return, the deduction would be limited to $1,000 of the excess, even in a community property state. But on separate returns, each could deduct up to $1,000. Where both spouses have some income, separate returns might be desirable if one of the spouses has extraordinary medical expenses. Medical expenses are deductible only to the extent that they exceed 3% of the taxpayer's adjusted gross income. On a joint return, the expenses must exceed 3% of the combined income of both spouses. The smaller income on a separate return will result in a smaller exclusion, and therefore may result in a larger medical expense deduction. Example, during the taxable year, H has adjusted gross income of $9,000, and W, his wife, has adjusted gross income of $3,000. W was ill during the year and paid a doctor $500 and paid a $300 hospital bill. If H and W file a joint return, they will be entitled to a medical deduction of $440, which is $800, total medical expenses, less $360, which is 3% of $12,000. If they file separate returns, W would be entitled to a med medical deduction of $710, which is $800 total medical expenses, less $90, 3% of $3,000. Where the taxpayer's income is in the very low tax brackets, or where both spouses have an approximately equal amount of income, the tax liability will be about the same on a joint return as on separate returns. In such a case, it might be preferable to file separate returns, because then one will not be liable for any deficiency which might later be assessed against the other. If they file a joint return, each is liable for the entire amount of the tax, not merely the amount of tax on his own income. Usually the tax should be computed both ways, on separate returns and on a joint return, and the tax liability compared. If a husband and wife do file separate returns, both must take the standard deduction or use the optional tax table, married persons filing separate returns, 10% standard deduction, where adjusted gross income is under $5,000, or else neither one can do so. Taxpayer's election. An election to file a joint or separate return may be dictated by the following considerations. One, joint return if. A. Both have income, but only one spouse has capital losses in excess of capital gains. B. Dependency exemption may be lost. C. One spouse has large charitable contributions and small income. 2. Separate returns if A. Both spouses have substantial capital losses in excess of capital gains. B. One spouse with small income has large medical expenses. C. Spouse wishes to avoid any deficiency liability which might be assessed against the other. Returns in Community Property States On a joint return, the effect is that the tax on one half of the taxable income is doubled in computing the total tax. It follows that if each spouse has the same amount of taxable income, the total tax will be the same whether returns are separate or joint. In the community property states, one half of the community income may be reported on the separate return of the husband and one half on the separate return of the wife. 
The theory is that one half belongs to each. The result is that in most cases, in community property states, there will be no difference in the result between joint and separate returns. The following are community property states, Arizona, California, Idaho, Louisiana, Nevada, New Mexico, Texas, and Washington. Because of the advantages enjoyed by married taxpayers in community property states, Congress enacted the split income rates in 1948. <clears throat> if the tax on joint and separate returns does differ because there is also separate income or because of other factors, it will usually be in favor of the joint return. Change from separate to joint return. A husband and wife can file separate returns and then after the time for filing returns has passed, they may decide to file a joint return. This election may be made within three years after the date of the original return was first due without regard to any extension. An election to file a joint return is binding and may not be changed after the due date of the return. A different election may be made each year. Punch card form 1040A. Who can use form 1040A? Form 1040A is a simplified return especially set up for the use of wage earners whose gross income is less than $10,000. The gross income may include $200 or less of dividends, interest, and wages not subject to withholding, but must otherwise consist entirely of wages subject to withholding. If the wage earner's income is less than $5,000, he may omit the tax computation on Form 1040A and let the district director figure it for him. After the district director computes the tax using the optional tax tables, he will mail, mail either a bill for additional tax due or a refund for any of any overpayment. Where additional tax is due, it must be paid within 30 days after the bill is mailed. If he desires, however, the taxpayer can figure his own tax from the optional tax tables at paragraphs 3023 to 3027. If he does so, he must remit any balance of tax due with the return. An employee with gross income of at least $5,000 and less than $10,000 must compute his own tax on Form 1040A, taking a standard deduction and using the applicable tax rate tables, paragraph 3015 and 3017. He may not leave the tax computation to the district director. Form 1040A cannot be used by a married person making a separate return if the other spouse is itemizing deductions. Other restrictions result from the fact that the use of 1040A causes a taxpayer to lose the benefit of 1. Head of household or surviving spouse income tax rates 2. Retirement income credit 3. Credit for payments on estimated tax 4. Credit for federal taxes for non-highway gasoline and lubricating oil. 5. Exclusions for sick pay benefits. 6. Deductions for travel, transportation, moving, or outside salesman expenses. And 7. Income averaging. For the considerations to be taken into account in deciding whether to itemize deductions on Form 1040 or to use the standard deduction or, op or, or optional tax tables, see paragraph 921 and Paragraph 206. Taxable income and rates. Tax base. The income tax is found by applying the rates to taxable income. Taxable income is defined as gross income minus allowable deductions or adjusted gross income <clears throat> minus the standard deduction and the deduction for personal exemptions. I refer back to the chart on page 206. Individuals. The starting point for, for computing the taxable income of an individual, as in the case of all other taxpayers, is gross income. This does not include income wholly exempt from tax. The first step is to deduct business and income producing expenses and the other expenses which are deductible in arriving at adjusted gross income. The next step to be taken depends upon the taxpayer's choice. He can, he can take itemized deductions for contributions, medical expenses, non-business interest and taxes, and other allowable deductions in schedules on Form 1040. Or he can take the standard deduction instead of itemizing his deductions on Form 1040. 
The final step is to deduct the personal exemptions. The resulting figure is the taxable income to which the rates at paragraphs 3015 to 3017 are applied. If an individual elects to use the optional tax tables, paragraph 3023, the taxes in the table are found through adjusted gross income. Whether the taxpayer should itemize or take the standard deduction is explained in Chapter 9. Rates for individuals, estates, and trusts. The rates in force are a combination of a normal tax of 3% and a progressive surtax rate. The tables at paragraphs 3015 to 3017 are all combined, the normal tax rate of 3% with the surtax. There are eight rate tables shown at paragraphs 3015 through 3027 used by individuals. The table at paragraph 3015 is for separate returns by single or married persons. The table at paragraph 3016 is for joint returns by married persons and, re and returns by surviving spouses. The table at paragraph 3017 is for returns by heads of households. The tables reproduced at paragraph 3023 to 3027 are the optional tax tables for use by any of these if adjusted gross income is less than $5,000. Using the optional tax tables. How the optional tax tables are used. To find the tax using the optional tax tables, paragraphs 3023, 3027, first find the adjusted gross income in the appropriate line under the income columns. Then read across to the column headed by the number corresponding to the number of exemptions claimed. Taxpayers using the optional tax table must be sure to refer to the proper subtable as follows. Subtable 1, for a single person not a head of a household. Subtable 2, for a head of a household. Subtable 3, for married persons filing joint returns. Subtable 4, for a married person filing a separate return and using the 10% standard deduction and subtable 5 for a married person filing a separate return and using the minimum standard deduction. All the optional tax tables except subtable 5 allow as a deduction automatically about 10% of the adjusted gross income in lieu of itemized non-business deductions. The optional tax tables serve the same purpose for a taxpayer whose adjusted gross income is less than $5,000 as does the standard deduction for other taxpayers. The same considerations are pertinent in determining whether to use the tables as are applied in determining whether to use the standard deduction. Generally, it will be to the taxpayer, to a taxpayer's advantage to use the tables if his non-business deductions are less than 10% of his adjusted gross income. Taxpayers not entitled to use the tax tables. The optional simplified tax may not be used by an estate or trust, a non-resident alien, a citizen entitled to special classification because his major income is derived from sources within the possession of the United States, or a person making a return for a period of less than 12 months because of a change in accounting period. How the tables work. The optional simplified tax is based on adjusted gross income. The tax figures in the tables are so computed as to allow indirectly either a standard deduction of about 10% of the adjusted gross income or the minimum standard deduction. Exemptions are given the effect directly under separate columns for taxpayers with different numbers of exemptions. Whether the returns are joint or separate, the tables provide the final amount of tax. No, the, no further computation is necessary. The optional simplified tax is based on the adjusted gross income. Adjustments toward adjusted gross income are allowed when a short form return is made on Form 1040. Right to change. Right to change to or from an optional tax table. An election to use the standard deduction or an optional tax table is not a binding election. It may be changed by the taxpayer at any time before the end of the period for filing a claim for refund, usually three years from the date of filing the return. Tax computations illustrated. Income splitting. 
Under the law, the taxable income on a joint return of husband and wife would be split in half on the return. The tax computed on one half, and then the tax would be doubled. The result would be the final tax. However, the Internal Revenue Service has authorized use of a special tax rate table, paragraph 3016, which eliminates the need for such splitting of income on a joint return. The table takes care of the splitting of income. Payment of income taxes. Individuals. <clears throat> Current payment of most individuals' taxes is affected by means of withholding from wages and by de declarations and payments of estimated tax. If there is still any amount of tax due on the return filed after the close of the taxable year, it must be paid no later than the last day for filing the return. If more tax is withheld <clears throat> than is due, the filing of a return is one means of asking for a refund of the tax overpaid. If too much Social Security tax was withheld, more than $290.40 for 1967, because wages were received from more than one employer, the excess Social Security tax can be claimed when 1040 or 1040A is filed usually before April 16th following the calendar year, as a credit against the income tax shown on Form 1040A or Form 1044, 1967. Extensions. The Commissioner has delegated to district directors the authority to grant an extension not to exceed six months for the payment of tax due or for any installment. Interest at 6% per year is added to the amount of tax as to which the time was extended. Ordinarily, the extension will be granted only upon sh a showing that unless the extension is granted, undue hardship will result, such as the sale of property at a sacrifice price. Interest is always due when a tax is not paid on time, whether or not an extension of time is granted. It should be kept in mind that an extension of time to file a return is not an extension of time for payment of any tax due. Forms of ownership. The effect on taxes. Joint tenancy. Property is fre frequently held by husband and wife in joint tenancy, tenancy with right of survivorship. That is, it is held jointly by the husband and wife while they are living, and upon the death of either, the other automatically becomes the sole owner. A joint bank account is a good example. While both are living, the income from such property would be allocated equally to each. If under state law, each joint tenant is entitled to his or her half of the rents and profits. On a joint return, the same effect is accomplished through the income splitting provisions. Upon a sale of property held in joint tenancy, if state law provides for equal ownership of property so held, the sale price is allocable in equal amounts between the husband and wife unless arrangements for the sale were completed before the transaction or transfer which brought the joint tenancy into being. Interest in taxes on property held as joint tenants, with each of the parties having under local law an undivided interest in the whole, and a personal responsibility for taxes and comparable liabilities, may be deducted in full by the person who pays them. This, the same rule would presumably apply as to other expenses or deductible amounts on property held in this manner, where the, dedu where the deductible item is a liability of and was actually born in its entirety by one of the parties. The rule would probably be different where one party has an undivided but specified partial interest in property and does not, under state law, occupy the position of an owner of the whole and is not personally liable for the entire amount of tax or other expense. In this situation, it is likely that the right to claim a deduction would be limited to a part of the whole even if, even if the entire amount is actually paid by the taxpayer, nor in such circumstances would the balance of the deduction be allowable to the other party in interest because he or she did not pay it. Taking title as tenants in common. Where property is owned by tenants in common, each participant is charged with his share of the income depending on his interest in the property. If there are two tenants, each having an undivided one-half interest, the income is divided equally. If the tenants have undivided one-fourth and three-fourth interests, the income would be allocable in the same proportions. As far as husband and wife are concerned, the question as to reporting of income from property 
regardless of how a title is held, are frequently eliminated by the couples filing a joint income tax return. The above rules must be applied where separate returns are filed. Where, as distinguished from ownership and joint tenancy, property is held under a joint account or by purchase from a joint account, income from the property is taxable to each holder according to his rateable contributions to the joint account regardless of record title. Tenancy by the entirety. Under the common law, husband was entitled to, to the full use of the estate in entirety and to its income during the existence of the marital relationship. Therefore, in a state where the strict common law concept of a tenancy by the entirety exists, as in Massachusetts and North Carolina, the income from such property is allocable to the husband. Where an actual tenancy by the entirety exists in a state where the common law has been abolished, the income is divisible equally between the husband and wife, even though it is all received by one spouse. And regardless of the amount of contributions, either may have made toward the acquisition of the property. This is the rule in the District of Columbia, Indiana, Maryland, Michigan, Missouri, New York, Oregon, and Pennsylvania. Gains or losses from sale or exchange of property held by a husband and wife as tenants by the entirety must be divided equally, whether or not the common law rule prevails in a particular state. Interest in taxes on property held as a tenant by the entirety, with each of the parties having under local law an undivided interest in the whole, and being personally liable for taxes and comparable liabilities, may be deducted in full by the person who pays them. These rules apply primarily to separate returns of a husband and wife. On a joint return, the income splitting provisions would affect an equal divisions of income in, an, in any case. Earnings of a minor. A minor is taxed on his wages, on the income he receives from any property he owns, and on income from funds held in trust for him. Even though under state law, compensation for personal services of a child may belong to his parent, and even though such money is not retained by the child for federal income tax purposes, it is considered to be gross income of the child. Accordingly, if the gross income of a minor is $600 or more in the taxable year, he must file a return. On his return, the minor is entitled to his own deductions and exemptions, like any other taxpayer. All expenditures by the parent or the child in earning the income are treated as paid or incurred by the child. The fact that a minor makes out his own tax return and claims his own exemption does not automatically deprive his parent of an exemption for the minor. See paragraph 213. Example. Jack is a minor and earned $200 in the taxable year upon which no tax was withheld. Over one half of Jack's support is supplied by his father. The $200 is Jack's gross income, not his father's, and is not includable on the father's return. Jack himself is not required to file a return and no taxes are due since he had gross income of less than $600. Jack's father has a $600 dependency exemption for Jack since he supplied more than one half of Jack's support. Example 2. Suppose taxes were, held, were withheld on Jack's $200 earnings. He would file a return to obtain a tax refund. Jack's father is still entitled to the $600 dependency exemption for Jack. If a minor's income tax is not paid, an assessment made against the minor will be treated as if it were made directly against the minor's parent, to the extent that the tax is attributable to amounts received for the minor's services. Example 3. Suppose Jack had $2,000 taxable income from a trust and $1,000 in wages which under state law belong to his father. He is entitled to one exemption and does not file a return. Under the optional tax table, $333 would be due from Jack on adjusted gross income of $3,000. Of this, $163 would be attributable to the trust income of $2,000. Accordingly, if the total tax of $333 was assessed against the minor, the difference between $333 and $163, or $170, exclusive of any tax withheld on the $1,000 of wages, 
would be considered to be assessed against his father. If the minor can make, cannot make his own return, <clears throat> it must be made by his guardian or other person charged with the care of his person or property. If the return is made by the minor, it must be signed by him. If it is made by a parent as natural guardian or by a legal guardian, that person must sign the return. Paragraph 212, Personal Exemptions, is continued on the other side of this tape. Continuation of Chapter 2. Paragraph 212, Personal Exemptions. Deductions. An individual is entitled to deduct the following exemptions in figuring his taxable income. One, $600 exemption for the taxpayer. $600 for each spouse on a joint return. Two, $600 exemption for each dependent whose gross income for the year is less than $600. The $600 gross income limitation does not apply to a dependent child under 19 or to one who is a student, regardless of his age. See paragraph 213. Three, $600 additional exemption for the taxpayer if he reaches the age of 65 before the end of the taxable year, doubled on a joint return if both spouses reach 65 before the end of the taxable year. Four, $600 additional exemption for the taxpayer if he is blind at the close of the taxable year. This is also doubled on a joint return if both spouses are blind. No additional exemption is allowed because a dependent is blind or 65 or over. Five, if a married person files a separate return, he gets the exemptions for his spouse under 1, 3, and 4 above only if the spouse has no gross income and is not the dependent of another taxpayer. Additional old age exemption. The extra old age exemption may be taken on a joint return by each spouse if each becomes 65 before the end of the taxable year, no matter how much income each has and even though one of them may have no income. An individual is assumed to be 65 on the first moment of the day preceding his 61st, 65th birthday. Blindness. The determination of whether the taxpayer is blind is made as of the last day of the taxable year, but in the case of death, it is made as of the date of death. An individual is considered to be blind only if his central visual acuity does not exceed 20 over 200 in the better eye with correcting lenses, or if his visual acuity is greater than 20 over 200, but is accompanied by limitation in the field of vision, such that the widest diameter of the visual field subtends an angle no greater than 20 degrees. Paragraph 213, Dependence. Exemption for Dependence. There are three requirements to be met before a taxpayer can deduct a $600 exemption for a dependent on his return. First, the dependent must come within a class of persons specified in the law. Second, the taxpayer must have furnished more than one half of that person's support or have been one of a group who contributed more than one half of the support. And third, any dependent except a child of the taxpayer who is under 19 or who qualifies as a student, must have had less than $600 gross income of his own. The specified classes of dependents are as follows. One, a son or daughter or a descendant of either. Two, a stepson or stepdaughter. Three, a brother, sister, stepbrother, or stepsister. Four, father or mother of anse or ancestor of either. Five, stepfather or stepmother. Six, a son or daughter of a brother or sister. Seven, a brother or sister of father or mother. Eight, a son-in-law, daughter-in-law, father-in-law, mother-in-law, brother-in-law, or sister-in-law. 9. A person who has his principal place of abode in the taxpayer's home during the entire taxable year and is a member of the taxpayer's household. 
This does not include a spouse or an unrelated person such as a common law wife whose residence is not sanctioned by local law. Or, 10, a descendant of a brother or sister of the father or mother of the taxpayer, that is, a first cousin of the taxpayer, who is receiving institutional care by reason of a mental or physical disability, and who, before receiving such care, was a member of the same household as the taxpayer. In deciding whether a dependent is a child of the taxpayer, one who is under 19 or a student, who can earn $600 or more without losing the dependency classification, the word child means a son, stepson, daughter, or stepdaughter. A legally adopted child, including a child who is a member of a taxpayer's household if placed for adoption with such taxpayer by an authorized placement agency, is treated as a child by blood. A brother or sister for the dependency test includes a brother or sister of the half-blood. On a joint return by a husband and wife, the deduction is allowed for a relative of either spouse if the relative is in the specified class. Example 1. Mrs. Jones' brother has a small son who receives more than half his support from Mr. Jones. On a joint return, an exemption for the nephew may be taken. On separate returns, Mrs. Jones cannot take the exemption because she did not contribute more than half of the support of her nephew, and Mr. Jones may take the exemption only if the nephew lived in his house and was a member of his household during the taxable year. A taxpayer is, in, is entitled to a dependency exemption for each parent of his total contribution toward the parent's support, not to more than one half of the parent's combined support. A taxpayer can claim a deduction for the personal exemptions of his or her spouse if the spouse, one, has no gross income, and two, is not the dependent of another taxpayer. A spouse can never be claimed as a dependent. A married person who is not a taxpayer on a joint return can be a dependent of the taxpayer, other than the husband or wife, within the specified degree of relationship. But when the exemptions of a husband and wife are claimed on one return, it is a return of two taxpayers rather than a one taxpayer and one dependent, even though the wife or husband has no income of her own. A divorced or legally separated spouse, husband or wife, is not one of the specified relatives. He cannot be a dependent of his divorced spouse, nor can they file a joint return. Example 2. Taxpayer husband who is under 65 years of age files a separate return for the taxable year. His wife, who is also under 65 years of age, has no gross income and is not the dependent of another taxpayer. The taxpayer husband is entitled to claim two personal exemptions, one for himself and one for his wife. He is not entitled to an additional exemption for his wife as a dependent. A citizen of a foreign country may be claimed as a dependent, but only if he is a resident of Canada, Mexico, the Canal Zone, or the Republic of Panama. A dependency exemption is allowed for a legally adopted child, including children who are members of the taxpayer's household, if placed, by an auth if placed with him by an authorized placement agency for legal adoption who is not a citizen or resident of the United States, if the child has as his principal place of abode for the taxable year the home of the taxpayer, a United States citizen living abroad, and is a member of the taxpayer's household. Any payment to a wife which is includable in her gross income as alimony is not a payment by the husband for the support of a dependent. But if he pays her a sum specifically for the support of any of their children, uh, that payment may be taken into consideration in determining whether he furnished more than one half of the support of the child. Exemption for child on parents and child's return. In computing the tax on a minor's return, he is entitled to a $600 personal exemption under the above rules. And if the child is under 19 and the father furnishes more than one half of the support, the father is also entitled to an exemption on behalf of the child. This is also true if the minor is 19 or over and is a student. In either case, the fact that the father is entitled to a dependency exemption for the child does not deprive the child of the right to take his personal exemption on his own return. 
What is included in support? In order to claim a dependency exemption for any person, the taxpayer must furnish more than one half of the support of that person for the taxable year. Support includes the cost of food, shelter, clothing, medical and dental care, education, church contributions, recreation, and so forth. Whether the dependent lives in quarters for which the taxpayer is paying rent or in a house which the taxpayer owns, a proportionate part of the fair rental value is counted toward the support furnished. When a dependent has an independent or other source of funds, including Social Security benefits, it is only the amounts which are actually spent by him on his own upkeep which are matched against the amount spent by the taxpayer in finding who contributed more than one half of the dependent's support. The term support does not include federal, state, or local income taxes paid by, the, paid by a dependent on his own income. Public assistance paid by a state on the basis of need is presumed to be consumed entirely in the recipient's self-support. If it is more than one half of the total support cost, therefore, it will prevent another person's claiming the recipient as a dependent. It is quite possible that a taxpayer would be entitled to a dependency exemption for a child who earns more than enough to pay for his own upkeep. Example three. A 17-year-old boy earns $2,400 during the taxable year. He lives at home with his parents in a rented home. The father pays all of the rent and pays all of the son's expenses for food, medical expenses, clothing, and so forth. The total cost of the son's support is $2,000. However, the son pays none of this and deposits his $2,400 earnings in the bank. Under these facts, the support test is met and the father is entitled to a dependency exemption. Scholarships received by a child for study at an, edu at an educational institution are not considered in determining whether a taxpayer has furnished more than half the support for his child. An appointment to the United States Military Academy, Naval Academy, Air Force Academy, or Coast Guard Academy however, is not a scholarship. But payments to a college student in the Naval Reserve Officers Training Corps for tuition, books, retainer pay, travel, meals and lodging are a scholarship. Room and board supplied by a school to a full-time student nurse is a scholarship and is not included in support. Amounts expended for the training and education of handicapped children qualify as a scholarship. Likewise, room, board, and tuition of mentally handicapped children paid by the state qualify as a scholarship if the institution qualifies as an educational institution and the children qualify as students. Enroll in and regularly attend the classes which comprise the curriculum. Multiple support agreements. The general rule is that more than one half of the support of the dependent in his calendar year must be contributed by the taxpayer before the dependent can be claimed as an exemption. However, if more than half the support during any calendar year is furnished by two or more persons, each of whom would be entitled to the exemption, except for the fact that he did not alone furnish more than half the support, one of them may claim an exemption for the dependent, providing he furnished more than 10% of the support. In such situations, everyone else who contributed more than 10% of the support must file a written declaration on Form 2120 that he will not claim the individual as a dependent for any taxable year beginning in that calendar year. Example 4. Four brothers together contributed the entire support of the mother in the taxable year in the following percentages. A. 30%, B. 20%, C. 29%, and D. 21%. Any one of the brothers can claim the exemption for the mother if he attaches to his written return declarations from the other three which waive the claim for the exemption. The taxpayer with the exemption may also take a deduction for medical expenses paid for the dependent. Other taxpayers in the multiple support agreement, however, may not claim deductions for medical expenses they pay for the person covered by the agreement. The maximum tax benefit can thus be achieved by having the taxpayer who claims the exemption pay all or most of the medical expenses of the dependent. Gross income of a dependent. A taxpayer can take the $600 dependency exemption only if the dependent receives more than one half of his support from the taxpayer and is within the class of relatives described above. If the dependent satisfies these two requirements, he may receive up 
to $600 gross income without the taxpayers losing the right to the deduction. If the dependent is a child of the taxpayer and is under 19, the amount of gross income is immaterial even if it exceeds $600, if the child in fact received more than one half of his support from the taxpayer. If the child is 19 or over and has $600 or more of gross income, he can be claimed as a dependent only if he is a full-time student or taking full-time on-farm training under the supervision of a school or a state or political subdivision for some part of five calendar months during the calendar year in the taxable year of the taxpayer. Attendance at correspondence schools, employee training schools, or night schools will not qualify a child as a student. The fact that a dependent is married does not prevent his being claimed as a dependent. This is true even though the, the claim dependent may have filed a joint return with his or her spouse if neither had gross income of $600 or more, and neither were required to file an income tax return for the year. Example 5. The taxpayer's son graduates from the State University in June after a full semester in school. The taxpayer operates a business, and his son becomes a partner in September after the summer vacation. The son marries in October. The entire cost of the son's support for the first eight months of the year, all paid by the father, is $3,500. Assuming that the son paid less than that amount for his own support, the father is entitled to the dependency exemption, regardless of the son's share of the partnership earnings, unless the son files a joint return with his wife. Non-taxable income. The gross income of a dependent, which must be under $600, means only income that is taxable. It does not include amounts received as gifts, gifts, Social Security payments, unemployment compensation, insurance proceeds paid by reason of death of the insured, disability benefits, and so forth. To determine if the taxpayer has contributed more than one half of the support of a claim dependent, however, non taxable income received by the dependent is counted if actually used for support items. Example 6. During the taxable year, S contributed $1,200 toward the support of his father, a widower who received Social Security old age benefits in the amount of $1,000, which were applied toward his support. S may claim his father as a dependent since the Social Security payments are not includable in S's gross income for the $600 gross income test, and he supplied more than 50% of the total amount used for his father's support. No proration of dependency exemption. The $600 exemption deduction for a dependent cannot be prorated. Whether the dependent is in existence for the entire taxable year, that is, in the case of birth or death during the year. Example 7. A child is born on December 31, 1967 and dies January 1, 1968. A full $600 exemption is allowed on both the 1967 and 1968 returns of its parents. Head of Household. Special rate for head of household. A head of a household enjoys a special tax rate, slightly lower than that for a single individual who is not the head of a household. The head of household rates are shown in the table at paragraph 3017. Who is the head of a household? An individual is a head of a household only if he is not married or is legally separated under a decree of a court at the close of his taxable year if he is not a surviving spouse as described in paragraph 201 and if he maintains a household which is the principal place of abode of one a son or daughter including an adopted child stepson or stepdaughter or a descendant of a son or daughter these individuals do not have to be dependents of the taxpayer unless they are married but are still dependent at the close of the taxpayer taxpayers taxable year Head of household status, because of maintaining a household for a married child or grandchild, can be claimed only if the married descendant is also a dependent. Two, any other person claimed as a dependent, except for those qualifying as dependents under classes 9 and 10 of paragraph 213, or for those claimed under multiple support agreements. A non-resident alien cannot qualify as a head of a household. A taxpayer can qualify as a head of a household if he maintains a household for a dependent father or mother, 
The parent does not have to live in the taxpayer's house, provided that the taxpayer furnishes more than one half of the cost of maintaining the parent's principal place of abode. But a taxpayer who pays the entire expense of maintaining his parent's parent in a home for the aged does not qualify as a head of a household. The tax court holds that a bachelor who maintains his sister in a mental institution is entitled to the head of a household status. End of chapter 2.